So, yeah, there's uh, Shatroth City. And then there is a... I guess we could call it a grave city. Because, boy, it looks like a city that has been buried in a grave, doesn't it? The original exiles on Draenor found death to be an unsettling and unfortunate consequence of life. And so the Draenei hid their dead away in the subterranean grave city of Akundun, a labyrinthian marvel located beneath the forests of Terokar. Do me a favor, put that in the back of your mind for when we eventually get to Warlords of Draenor in this series. Just remember that for later. In fact, there's a number of things from this that uh, you should remember for when we get to uh, Warlords because of how much they try to rehash a lot of stuff from this expansion in Warlords. You may hear a very loud screeching or roaring sound. There used to be, like, a big, like, frost worm kind of flying around this zone, and you could hear it really loud, loudly roar sometimes. But that's only going to be while, while we would be out here. There it is, right there. Yeah, that loud roar. Terribus the Cursed. Yep. So while you were questing in this zone... You were likely to hear that thing roar quite a few times. So. I have a feeling that some of you may be very familiar with this area. For one reason or another. So yeah. These four different areas are four different dungeons here. And, uh... I believe the order is going to be set the calls and then the... Akunai Crypts, then the Mana Tombs, and then the Shadow Labyrinth. This one you guys are probably... Shut up. Extremely familiar with, because this one has a mount I'm sure many of you have farmed or tried to farm for a long time. I will let you guys know that I had absurdly good luck with this one, where it dropped for me extremely early, and therefore I've haven't had to come back to this dungeon for a very long time. This is Sethic Halls, and you guys probably recognize these guys. Yeah, the Arakoa. If you guys have gone through the Spires of Arak in Warlords, you probably are, uh, are familiar with these guys. And that's part of the reason why we're actually here, is that we are trying, in, in the story of TBC to gain the Arakoa, the good Arakoa, as allies. Not the ones, the bad ones that we're going to be fighting here in this place that are fanatics and zealots. No, the good Arakoa we actually want to have as an ally with us in our battle against the Burning Legion and the Illidari forces, but again, Ilzheimer's. But that's why we are actually here. The, the reason we are going through the dungeons here in, uh, in Akundun is uh, to gain favor with the Arakoa, uh, you know, in order to be able to gain them as allies. That's why we're here. Lower your voice, Orc. I am no longer welcome in Sethic. The Sethic departed Skittis when Akundun exploded. My brother Sith was one of their leaders and told us we had to go into the ruins and face our god. In time, Sith had me cast out of the halls for doubting them, but he refused to let me take our sister Laka. Will you help me rescue her? Terok, hero of the Arakoa, mysteriously vanished one day, leaving only his mask and spear behind. Dark Weaver Sith still holds his mask, and Talon King Ikus guards his spear. It would mean a great deal to my people if these items were returned to us. I'm out of range. 
so we get reputation with the lower city. Like like I tried to uh, point out in the previous dungeons, you, basically when you did a dungeon DBC, you were uh, gaining rep with something. It's one of the reasons why it was like an encouragement to just keep doing the dungeons in TBC a lot, over and over. Not just for some of the like specific challenges, but because you probably need to do a lot of runs in here in order to gain, in order to gain rep, so you could be able to get access to certain things that were going to be probably mandatory to have when you were going to be doing even harder content like the raids. Huh, <laughs> a BOE. Now, you'll also notice something else that's, that's uh, going on here. You notice how these two are fine, but then there's this one called the Time Lost, and he seems to be kind of f almost fading half in and half out of existence. Yeah, believe it or not, that's actually not, uh, like, some kind of, you know, there's an actual reason for that. In fact... They are also in Warlords. Like I said uh, before, a lot of stuff they had in TBC, they tried to make sure was also here in Warlords to kind of keep the continuity of, well, this is, you know, basically the same place, it's just different in Altered Timeline and blah, 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 blah. So, this is our first boss. Dark Weaver Sith is charged by the Talon King Ickus to defend the Sethic Halls while the renegade Arakoa search for their enigmatic god. A master of shadowy magic, this wise and trickster has learned how to bend the very elements to his sway. As you can see, he is a uh, quite the elemental shaman, since he can be able to actually not just summon fire, frost, and, ar and uh, arcane elementals, but also shadow elementals. Gosh, wouldn't that be awesome for us to be able to do a shaman? He, of course, has other shaman abilities, sh the shocks, the chain lightning. Yeah, you get it. Nice bet to have weapons. Not so nice. Mwah. There's the Frost Shock. More Chain Lightning. Come on. Oh, there's Laka. Come on. Summon your elementals. I wonder if Spell Reflection would actually kill him. Nope. It did a little bit of damage. It actually did a teeny bit of damage. How about that? That's funny. No more pain. Well done. Hurry, though. We don't want to be caught. Well, hello there, Mr. Ethereal. Where did you come from? Dealer Vishad. Not to worry, warrior. With this barrier in place, the Arakoa cannot see me. I am here on business. I have a buyer who is interested in the eyes of the Cobalt Serpents that have taken up residence here. If you were to bring me some of these rare gems, I would cut you a portion of the profits. Do we have a deal? Maybe. Alright, let's get you out of there, Laka. Let me out of this cage. I'll have you out of there in just a moment. Thank you for freeing me. I'm going to make my way to Shatrath. So, back in the day, there was only two bosses in here. However, there was also a third, but you had to do some work in order to actually make it appear. And this was not the only one that this was the case in uh, TBC. Remember the quest about uh, Nightbane that uh, we had over in, uh... Gosh, what was it? Was it... It was one of the dungeons over at Serpent Shrine, the, 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 the Coil Fang Reservoir. They were like, hey, why don't you go uh, not just take care... Oh, it was the, the Naga. The Naga was like, hey... Go uh, take care of a couple of these raid bosses, including this one that's secret, uh, you know, the named uh, Nightbane and Karazhan that only Medivh would know about. 
That, of course, was one of the big main ones back then, which that one I have never actually seen, like, you know, here while playing the game, spawn. Unlike the one in Return to Karazhan and Legion, which I have actually shown that happen on camera for you guys, as well as you seeing me have the mount actually drop for me. For those of you who have not seen it and want to see it, uh, it's in my main playthrough that I did on my Shaman. By the way, I've done this dungeon a number of times in... Uh... Actually, is this... No, I don't think this is a time-walking dungeon. The Mana Tombs are, but not this one. But, um... I've also heard that uh, those spirits that spawn from those guys... These prophets... So when you kill these guys, you'll notice those things. Those things can attack you, and they hurt. They're like the spiteful spirits that can attack you in Mythic Plus nowadays. So, look at this. It's Anzu! But wait a minute. Isn't he supposed to be a, a secret that, we, that uh, we need to do work to spawn? A mysterious avian deity worshipped by some of the more savage Arakoa. Anzu is a being whose origins and powers are unlike any other member of Outland's fallen pantheon. The Naru are silent regarding this malevolent creature, for Anzu's ways are hidden from even them. Now before we fight this guy, let me actually double check. about what it took to actually get this guy to spawn. Okay, so it required... So, heroic only. And it required a druid back in the day. But then later they made it where he just appears in the room and he can drop a mount. One that looks exactly like him. And I will talk about that more in a moment. I just want to double check what it was... So apparently back in the day, you needed a druid with an essence-infused moonstone in order to summon Anzu. So he was a large bird, eagle, or vulture who lived in the realm of the gods. He was originally a benign creature, but sometime around 2000 BC, stories were related that he rebelled against the gods. There's some other stuff here about, like, I guess some real life like mythos that the developers probably took from in order to be able to create this thing. I'm just curious about if that's all it took. Just make sure you have a druid and that they have this uh, essence stone, filled stone, in order to actually get him to appear here. Otherwise, it just wasn't possible. Now, fortunately, in Burning Crusade, they made druids a bit more playable and viable to play, so you actually saw more druids around at that time. You know, at that time, compared to vanilla, where it wasn't exactly the most desired of classes when it came to groups or just by players. So, on heroic only, he can drop this, the reins of the Raven Lord, which, as you can see, is basically exactly him. Now, I was extremely fortunate. Uh, let me see if this is listed here. There it is. On November 6, 2019, I was able to get this guy to drop for me. Here's the funny part. I'm pretty sure that was only the fourth time or seventh time that I killed him. This guy dropped for me super early, like only six, four or seven kills, something like that, and he dropped for me. And I was just like, oh, oh. Now keep in mind, this guy does not have a high drop rate. <laughs> From what I've heard, this guy's drop rate is like, what is it, around 2% or something like that? And I've seen reaction videos where somebody had it drop for them and he sh was he is shouting at the top of his lungs, about finally, like after two years of farming it, it finally dropped for him. And that I can understand. I had a very similar reaction myself when Ash of Alar finally dropped for me. Because I had faced Kael'thas almost 250 times before he finally dropped that mount. 
Now, is it one of my favorite mounts? No, not really. Also, you'll notice the spirits are here. When I first entered here, you'll notice that it said... Where, where, did I already pass that? Yeah, I did. Well, anyways, it said that these spirits had spawned. So, anyways. So he has Paralyzing Screech, Flesh Rip, Dive, Spell Bomb, Cyclone of Feathers, and Brood of Anzu. If the mount actually drops here, I'm gonna laugh. And feel bad for anyone who hasn't had a drop of them yet. Nope. No mount. Did get a couple of pieces I didn't have before, though. The Boomstick! And I love that he's just right there in that room, just before you reach the third and final boss of this dungeon. Trinkets, yes! Pretty trinkets. Power! Great power! Power in trinkets! Trinkets! Talon King Icus was the charismatic spiritual leader of the daring group of Arakoa, which left their home in the Tarakar forest in search of a promised god. He had received dreams of this god as he slept, and knew that revelation lay within the crumbling halls of Akandun. Icus was driven insane by the visions, and now declares himself to, the, to be Terok Reborn, a divine hero from Arakoa myth. So he has Slow, Mana Shield, Polymorph, Arcane Volley, and Arcane Explosion. Which he does when he reaches certain health, so I probably won't be able to show it off to you guys. But, uh, yeah, this was one that could basically one-shot you back in the day. You make war on Icus? <laughs> I don't have anything that won't one-shot this guy. His Night Mace. I've heard that this axe was insanely good back in the day. I mean, it was a two-handed axe with three sockets. Now, sockets... Well, let's just say, like... I mean, if I was to show, say, my, my main right now, my demon hunter who has the multiple sockets, like, right now you can, ha you can try and get probably up to eight sockets on your gear total in Dragonflight... And the gems that they have allowed you to be able to make in this expansion really does add more relevancy to the sockets when it comes to your stats. It's probably not the same as it was back in the day, but let's just say, you know, getting a weapon or something with multiple sockets like that was, especially back in the days of Burning Crusade, was a huge deal. Ah, these are marvelous. Well done. Here's your cut, as promised. Yeah, we'll be hearing more from the Ethereals later. They'll play a role later on. Maybe not necessarily in Burning Crusade, but in WoW. In their own subtle ways, of course. After all, they're just here for business. It's all business to them. Knowing that Laka is free means I can cut the rest of my ties to the Sethic. Part of me will never forgive myself for Sith's death. But it had to be done. 
when I reach Skedis, I'll perform the death rites for him. I may never truly be forgiven for my role in the crimes of the Sethic, but perhaps by restoring the relics of Terok to my people, I can begin to redeem myself. So that was Sethic Halls, a dungeon that I'm sure many people still go back to to this day to try and farm the Raven Lord Mount, which I was extremely fortunate to get very early. Next, we will be doing the Akunai Crypts. Stay tuned. <laughs>